Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to Tech Leaders Hub. It is so good to have you all here today. Whether you're watching the recording or whether you're joining us live, we're very happy that you're spending some of your time with Tech Leaders Hub. My guest today is Avi Chesla, up until recently, XDR CTO at Cyber Reason, now leading his own cybersecurity startup, cybersecurity expert. Avi, how are you doing today? Good. Hi, Jacob. Uh, very good. Thanks for uh, having me here on the session. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it as well. Definitely happy to have you here on the session. Dear watchers and listeners, again, thank you for joining us. First things first, please let us know that you can hear us and you can see us. We're coming to you live. This is very much definitely not the first time we're doing Tech Leaders Hub, not our first live stream, but every time we want to make sure that everything is working correctly. So please leave a comment. Let us know that this is all working correctly for you. This is getting recorded, so we want to make sure that technically speaking, it's all good. You can hear us and you can see us. Please leave a comment, leave it now and tell us where you're kind of phoning in. From people are going to be joining us for just a second. Who do you hope is tuning in? Who do you think is going to benefit the most from the conversation that we have lined up today about you know, gravity data centers and the cybersecurity challenges that are related to that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I guess the, the simple answer for that would be a chief security officer or the CISO, the chief information security officer of uh, most types of organizations, but especially mid to large size um, companies. Um, and basically anyone that is involved with cybersecurity, especially in the security operation center operation uh, type of roles, um, I think will benefit and this uh, session will be uh, interesting for them. Yeah, lovely. And uh, if I know anything about Tech Leaders Hub, the people you mentioned are definitely going to benefit from this conversation. Usually we take the, the conversations in certain interesting direction that have a lot broader appeal. So I think if, if cybersecurity is close to your heart in any way, shape or form, in, in whatever your role may be, then yeah, you're going to benefit from listening to this. And by the way, the best way to benefit the most from these sessions is to leave comments, leave your own questions, and uh, Avi here will try to answer that so you can accelerate your path as a tech leader. Meanwhile, people are already coming with comments. Anthony is saying that he can hear us, amazing. And Sara can see and hear us as well. Thank you for the confirmation. That is super nice of you to mention. Excellent. That means we have everything set up and ready to go and we can get to the show. Now, the way we usually start Tech Leaders Hub is, well, some podcasts take a lot they, they can take quite a bit of time to get to the main point of the session, to get to delivering value, actually, I should say. Not this one, though. We try to deliver value right from the start. So, Avi, I wanted to ask you the traditional Tech Leaders Hub question. Every guest get, gets this at the very beginning. What is your number one tip for tech leaders? Yeah, well, I, I, I guess my, my comment will not be a technical comment. It would be more about... Uh, maybe management comments. Um, so, you know, based on my experience, you, you know, my main challenge was always, and my focus was always how to build a very strong team that can uh, work effectively together and uh, deliver product and solution to the customers, and sometimes in very difficult times and through very, you know, tough challenges and so on. And, and I, I, I guess my number one tip for tech leaders that are trying to establish or create a team and um, want it to be very successful within the company and the market is to focus um, and select people uh, basically by focusing on, on the potential of these people and not necessarily or less on their experience because there is a lot of um i think activity around what the employee or the person did in the past um but once you get to know him or her and understand what is the, actually the potential that they have this is more important than the experience and selecting people based on the potential 
is probably the best uh, tip that I have for now to uh, for tech leaders. Okay. Okay, I love that. And I'm really not surprised by what you said at the beginning. You know, running Tech Leaders Hub for, well, over two years now, it very often happens that it's not the tech side that decides whether you win or lose or your company wins or loses. It's it's the people side. It's building the right teams. So I'm not surprised you went in that direction, not at all. For this tip, I do have like one or two follow-up questions then. How do you actually check for somebody's potential? Is there a way to check for that during the recruitment process? Are you saying after recruiting them, you want to steer them in a certain direction? How do you uncover somebody's potential? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, uh, I guess there are various ways. I think that my way was always through the discussion itself with, uh, with the people, uh, with the person. And when I'm saying discussion, I'm, I'm talking about discussion about uh, technical or to, you know, technology challenges and how they figured out or how to solve them, what was their um, way of thinking when they try to solve the problem. Um, and it really doesn't matter if it was completely successful or not. It's more about the method they were using uh or selecting to solve a problem and that show a lot about the potential of the person uh overcoming challenges uh of different types um so this type of discussion allowed me to try to measure what is the potential um of the person and based on that doing that um beyond that is more about um energy and motivation that they are communicating um people that has potential um high potential usually communicate something um through their um words and i guess um you know body in a way that you really feel that energy so i i don't have a specific formula to tell you how to do that but yeah, this sure. is more about impression of uh, from the discussion itself yeah, uh, I can relate to that. I recently had a conversation with somebody that I'm working with and it was about, I mean, my role is marketing manager, right? I can speak from the marketing point of view, but still, even within marketing, you have people who are more individual contributors, more managers, strategists, etc. And I was talking with this person who was an individual contributor, but as they were talking about the state of the marketing at, at the company, they were saying, well, if, if I were responsible, well, not responsible, but like if I could set the strategy here, I would do this and this and this and that. And I really took note of that. That shows not just initiative, but this kind of higher level strategic thinking, right? So yeah. that definitely was a signal about their potential. Second thing I'm curious about then is because I understand within your teams, uh, what I'm curious about is that this uncovering of somebody's potential, can it potentially lead to them kind of changing roles or their roles kind of transforming? Can you give me an example of what this could look like? Yeah, it, it could look like, uh, I will give you an example from, um, from the company that I was leading. Um, the company name was Empower Cybersecurity and it, I was leading the company for about seven years. Um, so I'll give you an example within that, you know, that company. We, um, pretty early stage, I think after one year, um, I was recruiting someone that will help me more as a, a secretary or kind of um, um, someone that can support and help the, the CEO of the company. And it was a student, uh, which I thought a lot of potential um, through the interview process. Um, after five years, uh, she, in that case, was leading the product management within the company. Um, uh -huh. After doing other two roles, uh, she simply, you know, executed well and fulfilled her what I believe her potential, you know. Um, when I when I interview her, uh, so it was not my plan, but I guess it was um, some uh, something that support uh, exactly what I said. That you know, when you see someone who feel uh, this energy of potential, um, and um, 
and you give the opportunity. Of course, you need to give the opportunity for someone without an experience to get into these yeah. uh, new types of challenges, even if in that case she didn't do that before. Um, it's helped them to learn very fast um, and uh, motivate them to move forward. And this is what happened, you know, after four or five years, she was leading product management, which is a very uh, challenging role, right? And, and complicated yeah. role in, in, uh, in a startup company. Yeah, sounds like a huge achievement. Definitely kudos for that. And it's like you mentioned, I actually think it has two elements to it, right? You need to have the person that has the potential and then a leader that recognizes that potential and help and gives the opportunity to that person to to take a shot at it. So that's that's awesome that this is something that happened and Empow. Very well done. Very nice number one uh, tip for tech leaders. We'll add it to our library and definitely make like a short clip out of this particular part. But now some people definitely want to hear more about the subject at hand. Before we get to the subject at hand, probably a little bit more about you. Could you briefly talk about you know your profile, your cybersecurity expertise, so that when we get to the subject of data gravity centers and the challenges related to that, people know who they're getting the information from? Yeah, sure. So very, very briefly, um, my name is, you know, is Abi Chesla. I'm, ha I have uh, a little bit more than 20 years of experience in the cybersecurity space and networking space, and it's about to become cloud space as well, of course. Uh, but the main focus was always uh, cybersecurity, um, development of different types, large uh, spectrum of, of product that solve um, detect and prevent um, security attacks. Um, I started in a startup company as a CTO of a company that was acquired about 15 years ago, even more by a bigger company, public company called Rodware. I was there for about mm -hmm. eight or nine years as a CTO of the company. Uh, later on, I, later on I, I founded and led as a CEO uh, my own company, Empower Cybersecurity, that I mentioned earlier. We were developing um, a next generation SIM. SIM is a security information event management platform for SOC teams. Um, and later on, we were very early, I think, and in the, in the stage where XDR, which is Extended Detection and Response Platform, started to mm -hmm. be developed and introduced to the market. And we had a um, solution in that area as well. And then we were acquired by a company called, by Cy called Cyberism, um, a leading EDR company that decided to move into the XDR space. And this is why they decided to buy um, Empower Cybersecurity. Um, I've been there as a, a CTO of the XDR activity um, for a little bit more than a year, um, and now I'm I'm uh, part of a, a stealth mode startup where uh, we are dealing with the things that we will talk about today. You know, challenges that are involved with uh, data gravity centers. So it sounds like, in addition to being a cybersecurity expert, you're also a serial founder. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, more, more or less, you know, yes. I, I mean, two yeah. companies, um, that I was really, uh, a founder and, and leading them. So I had yeah. some yeah. experience in that area. Right. So I would ask you and actually our audience also to a certain extent to indulge me here for a second, because you mentioned some, um, key concepts that we haven't explored on this show that much yet. And I want to take into account an, an audience that maybe is not as familiar with them and also to increase my own knowledge. So you mentioned uh, SOC teams. I assume that's SOC. I've, I've heard of them before, but could you briefly define what do you mean by that? Yeah, of course. So uh, SOC, S-O-C, it's the Security Operations Center. I think that in today today market, any company from a mid-sized company, you know, if they have a few thousand employees uh, and above, uh, will have um, a small or at least a small SOC team that will include two or three um, what the market calls security analysts that are responsible to monitor the status and track 
if there is any kind of security incident that is being developed mm -hmm. against the organization. And once they um, identify it or think that there is a potential of, of cyber incident, they will start to investigate and develop uh, response actions that, um, to prevent or you know, to mitigate it. Um, it's all under the hood of the SOC. The SOC is responsible to do it. Um, so when I'm saying that, uh, you know, products are developed for the SOC, it means that um, this team of security analysts work personally and directly with these platforms. Obviously, okay. they cannot work in parallel with dozens or hundreds of tools simultaneously. They need platform that will consolidate all the data in a very mm -hmm. simple way that they can actually identify and correlate all the information to one console. Um, so these platforms are the SOC tools and the product that I mentioned before, XDR and SIM, are part of, of the platform you know, tools that they, the SOC are using. Right, and that's actually the next question that I had lined up here. In terms of XDR, could you, especially since you were just, you know, XDR CTO, so you're heavily involved in that, could you also expand on this a little bit for our audience? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you that XDR was kind of an initiative that I believe started from uh, EDR vendors. EDR is um, um, uh, our vendors that are uh, dealing or developing product uh, doing endpoint detection and response. Um, mm -hmm. And companies like Cyber Reason, other companies like CrowdStrike, Sentinel Ones, um, you know, Microsoft, you know, obviously, and some others, um, um, maybe started from the endpoint. It's like the lower part of the stack, you know, and, and trying to achieve larger market. In order to achieve larger market, they decided to move up the stack um, and they would define this solution as XDR, which means that you are not only collecting data from the endpoints anymore, uh, you extend your world and by having the XDR platform, you collect data from the endpoint, but also from your network devices, your cloud services, your IoT devices, basically any data source that the organization have in order to take and analyze all that information together and see if there is a, um, a clue or some kind of behavior that will say, listen, something wrong is going on here. It might be malicious, mm -hmm. um, someone trying to steal data or manipulate the data and so on. Every, you know, all the goals in, in, of attackers in the cybersecurity space and prevent them. So the XDR is really this tool that allow to collect all that information in some way, depends on, on the company develop methods to correlate all these pieces of information together and assemble kind of an attack story um, Okay. And if there is an attack story, then of course, prioritize that and develop response actions that will be able to, will allow you to mitigate it. So XDR, extended detection response, responsible to give a platform that allow the soft to do that. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. And lovely summary at the end there, uh, just in one sentence. Uh, thank you for adding that there. Excellent. And thank you. And hopefully for parts of the audience, that's going to illuminate a little bit what we're going to talk about here. So now what I wanted to move on to before we talk about uh, data gravity centers themselves, actually, I wanted to ask you, to be honest, it's been a while since we had a dedicated cybersecurity session on Tech Leaders Hub. So I wanted to use a little bit of our time here to talk about the latest trends and developments within this field. So for example, the this uh, XDR that you mentioned, I wanted to learn and our audience to also understand whether that's a rather new development within the field. And generally speaking, it's you know January 2023. What is top of mind in the cybersecurity field? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's um, it would be very good to start by highlighting. I think the main trends and developments, and XDR is part of it. Uh, it's not new. 
Um, and that related to maybe the first point where I think it's very significant trend. Um, before I will talk about the trend, I will talk about the, uh, maybe the challenge uh, that most of the organization have today in the CISOs and the CSO uh, of organization are saying that uh, there are too many tools uh, already mm. in their network. Uh, they invested a lot. They spent a lot of uh, good money uh, on, on effective and, and highly performing uh, cybersecurity products and others. Uh, but when they are saying too many, it means that they feeling that they need too much, too many people uh, to learn each one of the products, each one when it's with it its behavior and language and so on, to manage them and to really be able to get all the potential or you know the ROI from this uh, from these tools, mm -hmm. and that lead, leads to a trend in the last, I think, seven eight years already that you see a lot. Of a lot of vendor consolidation. You see that there is less room today for um, companies that develop point solution only because it's another tool that the company will need to buy, integrate, learn, and then they will need someone that will be expert in that tool and they don't have the, the, mm -hmm. the people to do it. So um, the first trend is basically uh, development of an appetite for a cybersecurity platform. Uh, and when I say platform, it means like XDR or next generation SIM, as I mentioned before, which allow you to take your existing tools without buying anything new and consolidate all these different tools with different language and different uh, behaviors into one um, language that allow the SOC in, the, in, in these cases, the SOC that we mentioned before, the security analyst, to talk with only with one product and by that controlling the detection, investigation, response, any function that they have. Um, and all that will be executed by many other technologies and tools, but they will need to work only with one uh, entity that will allow them communicate with all of them. So I think this is the first um, trend in the cybersecurity, probably beyond cybersecurity, but definitely cybersecurity is vendor consolidation and appetite for a platform. And you see that, you know, Google and, and Microsoft and and um, and even AWS, you know, the very large companies are investing a lot in creating these platforms because they understand mm -hmm. that this is the main challenge or the main requirements that organizations have uh, today in the cybersecurity space. So this is the first one. Um, so the second one, to yeah. dig, Just to stop you for a second there. So to dig a little bit deeper here, could you illustrate this with a possible example? So the way I see this is there are these individual tools that monitor individual things. And I would love to learn more about what these things exactly are. And then on top of them, so we're not using each tool individually, there's a layer that unifies them and allows you to access them all at once. So what are some examples of these tools, just so we can have a bit of a better idea? And then in terms of the layer on top, what are the big players right now? Yeah, so examples for tools are, as I mentioned for endpoint security tools like EDRs and endpoint protections uh, oh, okay. platform. Um, it can be any kind of cybersecurity cloud services, you know, like um, AWS Guard Duty, uh, like um, any kind of uh, security brokers um, that um, securing the co uh, communication to uh, cloud applications, um, firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, and antivirus, and many others. Um, all these tools exist within the organization, you know, and, and, and these are the tools that when I'm talking about consolidation, a platform that sits on top of them, like a layer on top of that, um, these are the tools that send information, uh, to that layer, this platform mm -hmm. that sits on top and, and, uh, the platform on top, uh, needs how to know how to translate all these signals that they are collecting from the uh, various products um, and classify that or translate that into one language, language of attack, cyber attacks. 
Uh, so if there is a um, suspicious activities in, in that was discovered but one by one endpoint, and then you see another suspicious activity from an email protection or email system that are associated with the same identity, right? With the same user, then um, the platform need to understand that this is probably uh, two activities that are part of the same attack, the same malicious intent. Maybe the um, starting point, the initial access was through email. It developed an infection somehow, and the endpoint was infected. So we got signal from the endpoint that there is some kind of uh, malware running on it, potentially. When you have these two dots together, it starts to make more sense and actually validate that there is a real attack right now that should be prioritized. So this is a very basic and simple example, but you need the platform to connect these two dots together and create for you the prioritized story of, of attack. Okay. Okay. And so you were mentioning that this is one main trend happening right now. What would be, yeah. I assume you have another one lined up, so I would love to hear about it. Yeah, there are a few more, but I think that the, the, maybe the top four, the one is the vendor consolidation and the appetite for platform. We will see more and more um, vendors that develop platforms and the market will demand it. The second one is what um, um, the market called the cybersecurity mesh architecture. Uh, CSMA. So cybersecurity mesh architecture, it's um, a concept. It's not a product. It's a concept that saying that an organization need to build a cybersecurity strategy that will be based on identity. And what does it mean? It means that um, they said, if, if you want to protect your employees and your assets, your, your data, you need to um, that your system, uh, your entire cybersecurity infrastructure will understand um, the identities uh, within your organization. Identity can be uh, users, employees, of course, and it could be an assets, you know, types of data that can be confidential and so on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this architecture con concept talks about the ability to identify these high prioritized identities um, and by prioritize them all the other system within your network will know that they need to focus on the activities of these identities specifically more than others um, it meaning it means that they need to collect more information about the behavior um, involved with these identities. It need to focus on um, anomalies related to the behavior of these identities. It need to set the permissions um, of what these identity can do or not allowed to do um, and so on. And um, they call it the identity control plan. You know, you have identity control plan that you will really, um, prioritize the security uh, through that control plane by uh, defining the identities that are most important for the organization. Um, so and identity so I'm curious security. about that. So you're saying some, of, some identities are more important to the organization than others. What might make an identity more important? Uh, so, so simple example would be their privilege, uh, privileges, right? If there is an identity that has um, access to confidential data, so it's a very important identity because if it will be compromised, if someone will right. steal the identity, um, um, he he or she can use uh, confidential data that will impact right. uh, negatively the, the, the business, uh, for example, or. Uh, will be able to take intellectual property um, and so on. That is very important for, for the organization or manipulate data that is important for the organization. So um, identity that has this, ac this access will be an important one. Um, uh, obviously, right. the chief uh, financial officer of the company, it's identity that would be very important because he has access to all the uh, very important you know, budgets and so on, um, 
information that related and so so is the ceo and the tech leaders and so on so uh, you can have thousands of employees um within the organization but maybe a few dozens are of very important identity not in terms of the work they are doing but in terms of the access they have the impact that they can have if you will compromise their computer their identities and so on okay so that's the second trend i am curious about kind of what the rate of adoption is of this is at this point and i have many many follow-up questions for that of course but i you, you mentioned there's a list of four, so maybe let's get through all four of them. Yeah, uh, I, I, there I are think... questions. Let's get them from the audience. You know, right, right. So I, I um, uh, the, the number three is the um, is is kind of a, a new capabilities that in the last few years uh, companies are investing at, uh, which is the ability to to predict the attacker's next steps because everybody mm -hmm. trying to reduce the time to detect and the time to respond to attack because successful attack is usually happens because you detected or respond too late to the attack uh, so everybody's trying to do it faster and trying to be more proactive and one of the best ways that the industry understood you know that need to lead that proactiveness is the ability to predict because there are in the again the, in the recent years there are a lot of developments in terms of algorithms and different methods to predict behavior it can be diseases it can be weather it can be other things failures and so on um and it's it in and in the last few years it started to get into the cyber security space based on all these um data that you collect all the time by this platform that we mentioned before like xdr and sim and so on if you have the the capability to analyze it and understand what's going on right now you can also develop the capabilities to predict what will be what is the potential next step of this attack because attack mm -hmm. is not so simple i mean the more advanced one has multiple steps they have multiple stages um and you can catch the preliminary stages or the first few stages and then predict what can be the next few stages and by doing that uh, you allow again the security operations center to evaluate what is the potential impact of an incident because when once you know the next steps you can understand what would be the achievement uh, of the attack uh, can be and based on that obviously prioritize or deprioritize the incident because maybe it's not so important what you know the, the result and um a prediction that will require and, and require predictive models it's it's um it's, it's something that get into um the cyber security space as well um so i'm curious so you're saying about predicting these attacks and basically seeing kind of before the attack happens, the warning signals. So can I ask you what are some typical warning signals? Is it something like somebody's attempting to log into an account from a suspicious IP? So before they get through, there's already a warning signal that there's more attempts or somebody's like pinging the server more often, testing the defenses. Obviously, I'm a little bit ignorant here. So can you give at least you know an example of what these warning signals could be? Yeah, I, I mean, there is, um, you know, one of the challenges that there are a lot of warning signals. Some of them can be yeah. false positive because in, it really depends on the context. It can come in a legitimate way or sometimes the same signal can be a very bad, you're already in a very, very bad situation. Now, a signal, as you said, uh, they start um, according to the attack stages. They start from the initial access or even before um what the market calls how security called the uh, pre-attack probes right someone is scanning your network trying to find open doors uh like ports or accounts that are not secured properly um and so on and then um the next the next step will be some suspicious emails like you know phishing emails and all that that mm -hmm. uh, um, can be kind of a vector to that allow them to get into the organization or into the employee account 
And then, and then there are different uh, malwares that uh, once are delivered and executed, they can do a lot of different things, which um, it thinks like that it is a clue by itself. Uh, so it can be, even if it, there is a new process that is running on your computer, that's supposed to be a legitimate process, but it was activated um, in an, you know, in the middle of the night. And usually it's, it's happened only during the walking day. Um, that could be a suspicious activity um, or an activity that um, take some information from your endpoint and move it to a cloud uh, storage resource. Again, that can be a legitimate behavior, but if it's happened, you know, in the end of the week, it's usually not supposed to happen. So this is uh, kind of an anomaly that would look like a suspicious activity. Um, each one of them right. are no, right. is not necessarily an attack, but when you take all of them together, um, you can see an attack story, and then you could be sure that something really bad is, is developing against the organization. Right. Thank you. That made it much more concrete and helped me visualize this a lot better. Uh, so thanks for expanding on that. Okay. So, well, that was, as I recall, trend number three. What is number four? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the prediction always come obviously with, with uh, what I call the predictive response. So once you have, um, you, you have a prediction of the attacker next steps, um, then you can be more proactive because you can put some um, measures to prevent the next steps before they're mm -hmm. happening. And then by that, you're really proactive. Um, so this is the predictive responses. Um, just to give you an example, okay, there are a few um, um, signals that are associated with specific identity and it's took based on these signals, um, you know, after correlating all of them, that there is, uh, high potential here or probability that the um, account or the identity, there was an account takeover, meaning that the identity was stolen and, and, and someone else using the identity of one of the employees, for example, in the organization. Now, one of the next steps that can happen is sharing information or erasing information, manipulating data that this um, uh, identity has access to, uh, to be proactive around that, um, someone in the organization can say, okay, I will do a proactive response by disabling some of the permission that this identity has. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. even that it was compromised, nobody can change or manipulate or collect data that can be very important for the organization. So, um, and the last one is um, counter attacks. This is something that related to um, to the fact that once you are under attack as an organization or a person, whatever, uh, in the cybersecurity space, you are usually not allowed to attack back, what I call a counterattack. Um, yeah. uh, not because it's not fair, it's because everybody afraid that if everybody will start to develop these attacks, so everybody will become an attacker. Um, and and um, I disagree with that approach. I think that, as, as many governments are doing, by the way, um, but also regular organization, non-government organization, uh, we need to allow them to use strategies of counterattacks. Uh, given that they are doing that in a response manner, meaning that they are not initiating that just you know, out of the blue. If they are under attack and identifying the data, the, the source of the data, the, the sources of the attack, then trying to attack them back. And by mm -hmm. doing that, they will raise the attacker's costs. Um, because if attackers uh, will see that someone is attacking them back and they are failing because of that to do other things, they might and probably actually decide to move to another target because there is no benefit in continuing to attack someone that's attacking you back and, and create right. some damage. Because, 
because this target can actually hurt me back somehow. So I'm going to steer. Clear. Yeah. But can you? Yeah. So so here again, I would I would love to visualize this a little bit better. What what could be a potential counterattack then? What moves are possible, or what usually happens? Yeah, I, I don't think that we can. You know, today in today market, as I, as I explained before, it's not really allowed for any organization to just attack another organization. So there are different techniques, but it can be uh, just to give a very high level example. It can be a way that. Once someone attacking you, you will reply back with some pieces of data that will force his computer to, you know, reboot, right? He will crash the computer and, and then mm -hmm. it will take him a few minutes until it will recover. Just a simple thing like that. But once you're an attacker, you really don't like it, right? You, you prefer to do uh, your attack persistently in without any disturbance so so um maybe this is a very high level but a small example it can be effective against attack attackers okay right yeah it's, it's almost like disarming them right they're attacking you using a computer so you hit the computer and try to make right. it not uh function anymore awesome exactly. right so wow I, I got a lot asking this question about uh trends and developments you really painted a you know a large landscape here and that's beautiful i think anybody who wanted to catch up on that now has a much better idea of where, of where this uh, field is at i was wondering if there's more where that came from in terms of something you would like to add here otherwise we should probably talk about data gravity centers at least for a little bit of the session because time is really running fast right. here right yeah I, I would love to you know to move to the data gravity center and um, um yeah, yeah so let's go so let's move to that and I'll basically ask you about what's in the title of this session. So definitely we can start with defining data gravity centers for anybody who's not exactly aware of what that means. And also what are the cybersecurity challenges? What are the risks involved in that? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in simple words, um, a data gravity center is basically the location where an organization keeps significant amount of its uh, dig digital data. Um, we call it the data gravity center because as in, the, in physics, as long as you have more mass, in this case, more data, uh, it will pull more data into it. And um, data gravity centers are were created in the, in the last few years um, within many organizations because they are uh, using, of course, specific data centers and cloud services that collect and store huge amount of data. So these locations become uh, and defined as their data gravity center because they are trying to uh, develop all their applications and other uh, processes very close to the data. This data really pull everything to be closer to that, uh, to it. So this is why it's, it is being called the data gravity center. Um, the challenge or the cybersecurity challenge here, um, it's, uh, it's, it's really about all that approach because the approach of aggregating all the data into a single place, like a single data center in the cloud or any other data center really inflates the timeline of security analytics and response. Because although there are really great algorithms and technologies that analyze correlated data, do prediction, response, and so on, as long as the, um, including artificial intelligence, machine learning methods, and so on, that know how to automate the, the process of analytics, um, as long as the data sets become very large in terms of volume, and this is the situation within the data uh, gravity center, it increases the cost of the storage of the data, the network and compute, as well as create a very high latency of security analytics. Because one, you need to process a huge amount of data Try to figure out and, and find, you know, find the needle in the haystack. And this is a very big haystack. Um, you want to do it very quickly. As I said before, uh, most of successful attack happened because they were detected too late. It was, mm -hmm. it took too much time. 
Um, and with today data gravity centers, the, the latency is very high, the latency to security insights. Um, so to summarize the main challenges here, one is cost. Uh, and I know that from experience with customers that large and very large organization have very, uh, they have a few data gravity centers and their annual costs of storage, compute and network uh, operation around that, it's huge. It's, it's unbelievable. And as we all know, uh, data just um, become larger and larger. I mean, the big data problem that started 10 years ago, or even before, and it just uh, multiplied itself all, all the time. Um, yeah. So one is the cost. Second is the high latency, which is a problem. And, and the last thing which I, I related to is the noise and false positive, because when you have so much data and you try to analyze and find these individual clues or these needles, um, there is no way that you will do it accurately. Uh, no matter how, um, what type of technology and how uh, well it, it, it actually performed, um, uh, it really created a lot of false alarm or alarms, alerts that are not really relevant or should be prioritized. And that's create uh, a lot of workload for the SOC, for the security operation center and the analysts because they are flooded with so many alerts and, and they need to figure out which one is real, mm -hmm. which one is not, and then prioritize that. It's, it's, it's not something that uh, they can do very efficiently. Right, I understand. So to, to my mind, this brings, this reminds me of one of your previous examples, right? You mentioned that, for example, you can analyze a certain person, whether they move certain data, you know, at a certain time of the day when they usually wouldn't be awake, for example. But when the data set is, you know, thousands of people moving different kinds of data, when you're starting to look for anomalies there, it gets much more noisy and, and it's not nearly as clear that this is something that, that might indicate an attack. Am I kind of on the right track here in terms of understanding? Yeah, this? yeah, yeah, exactly. As, as it's, it seems to be simple once you know exactly what are the steps. But as you said, when you have so many people and so much data involved with, yeah, with yeah. these people, uh, it's not only the login, which they are doing a lot of logins, it's the data transfer and the other operation that are on the endpoint with the mail and the others. And when you're collecting everything and put in one place and you're trying to apply even very advanced technologies, they create a lot of uh, false alarms or what the market calls false positive. And, and this is uh, uh, a great problem. And and and, uh, and the previous one, the latency is maybe even bigger because if you have an attack, you want to, as we said before, we want to try to be very proactive. So you try to reduce the time yeah. to detect and response as much as you can. And data gravity centers just works against it uh, because they are just extending these sets of data in, in a way that does not allow you to, to make the, to get the insights very quickly. Right. Okay. So, well, the natural next question, of course, is we defined the challenge, described it. Now, I imagine some leaders or executives in charge of cybersecurity are listening to this thinking, okay, I have a data gravity center like this. We are facing this problem. What is a potential solution here then? Yeah. So, so as I mentioned, I think in the beginning of, of our session, you know, we are dealing with that, with that um, and I'm personally with um, a few of, of, um, of my friends that, that are dealing with that uh, challenge. It's a great challenge. I mean, um, our concept um, for a solution is what we call the shift left concept, meaning you don't need as an organization just blindly send all your information all the information that you have to the this data gravity center first of all um there are a lot of decision that you can make very close to the data source itself before mm -hmm. you moving all that data and if you have the ability to classify the data that really going out originated from the data source but very close to the data source and 
define based on the classification, what is the value of that data? Is that high value? Will we, will we have high value by sharing it and, and put it in a central place because it will be very critical to see if this is part of, of an attack, a stage within an attack that can correlate with other stages or mm -hmm. it doesn't. Um, so basically try to score the data when it comes out from the data source and say, okay, there is no sense in sharing it. We can make a decision right now. We call it the shift left. We, we shift the decision to the left or yeah, yeah. if there is a value, let's shift it right, you know, to the place where all the data, huge amount of data exists. But now, because we have this ability to classify and select what need to be shift, shifted to the right and what to the left, uh, it will be smaller data sets. And if it will be a smaller data set, then it reduces the cost of storage, compute, and network operation. It will um, reduce the latency um, as well as reduce the amount of false positive and noise because you reduce the data set, you uh, create a data storage which much more relevant data for an attack, for analysis of mm -hmm. an attack. So all the technology can work um, cybersecurity technologies can work much more efficiently. Um, okay. Low latency and better uh, with more accurate decisions. Right. So I'm, I'm glad you used this uh, needle in a haystack analogy before, because the way I'm understanding what you're saying here is that before you put the full haystack together, as you're putting more hay into the stack, you already look at it and you kind of split it into Okay, if there's a needle, it's probably in this smaller part of the haystack. Check there first. Otherwise, it might be in this second stack and very low probability it's anywhere in the rest of, well, the hay in this case. But in that sense, you can find it really much more quickly, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you do some kind of, we can, we can define it as placement of security decision across the different locations, right? Um, I see. In some cases, depends on data, you can place the decision very close to the data source and that's it. In some places, say, okay, it's not enough. I need to share it with some other pieces of data that I don't have it right here. I have it in another mm -hmm. place in order to see the real um, behavior or understand the behavior. Okay. Um, and by classifying and selecting uh, what what you want to do, you you allow to really distribute the decision in in an optimal way. You reduce the cost, increase the the your insights with a more accurate uh, uh, with more accuracy. Okay, wow. So I'm I'm very mindful of the time here, and we're actually running out, unfortunately. So one last or maybe two final questions. By the way, watchers and listeners, if you have questions now is basically the last, last call for you to ask yours. So think about that. What I'm going to ask is, I heard from you, Avi, conceptually, what is to be done about this problem, this shift left and limiting the size of the stack, let's say. But if somebody is here on the call thinking, okay, I would like to implement that for my organization, is there currently a tool that does that? Is there a solution that does that? Is there is there a way to implement this? Yeah, we, we will be happy. You know, I will be happy to to discuss that with anyone that think um, you know he would like to test and understand the concept better uh, than what we have presented here. And yes, there is a way to talk with me and my colleagues and uh, see if we can. Uh, really help in, in uh, showing and proving that in, in the organization. Okay, I see. So so basically the, the, the way to try and uh, implement this is to talk with you and it sounds like you've got something in place that might be able to uh, to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. The reason is that there is no you know public demo and things like that because we are really, as I mentioned in the beginning, in the early stage of uh, of uh, that um, that area, um, so we need to really do it more uh, closely through discuss discussing it and uh, uh, developing the solution for uh, the specific case. 
Okay, awesome. Wow. Uh, very well then. So definitely we'll ask the watchers and listeners who are interested in that to contact you. So Avi Chesla. Avi, uh, before we finish up the session, by the way, we did have some comments in the meantime. Mikoa is saying interesting session. Well asked questions. I, I mean, <laughs> I will ask question is nothing without an interesting answer. And I think that's what really helped the session be so as good as it was. And Rani saying, simple and brilliant. Awesome, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, always appreciate the comments, every single one that comes in. Thank you so much. So um, Avi, final question for me. Is there anything that you would like to add to this topic that I failed to ask about? Something that we didn't touch upon that you think is an important piece of this puzzle before we start saying goodbye? Um, no, I, I think we cover pretty much, uh, pretty much everything. I just wanted to say that there is a, um, Another trend, which is not a cybersecurity trend within the companies that uh, in, in current market that everybody believe that, not everybody, but a lot of employees that I, 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 uh, I talk with believe that it's really hard to innovate because um, in today's world, everything was innovated already. Someone thought about something and developed the app, the product or whatever. Um, and I disagree with that, you know, when, when we are talking and start to brainstorm about uh, different ideas uh, regarding data gravity centers, shift labs, and so on. Uh, there are always uh, there is always potential for innovation for things that were nobody did before or thought about before in a serious way. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that if uh, every, you know for people here in the session, um, if you feel that innovation is too hard right now. It's you know um, just not doing that because of it. I think it's wrong. You need to uh, uh, think about how you can innovate in anything that you're doing. It's not only technology. It's the storytelling is the business plan. Is the support activities. There is a lot of room for innovation, and um, I greatly and you know all, all the company that I led or greatly believe in, in innovations. Uh, uh, so I'm. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I love that. But that's such an inspirational note to end on. I, I'm really glad I asked that last question. So definitely thanks for adding that in. Very well then. Doesn't seem like there's any final questions coming in for this particular session. So we will be wrapping up here uh, slowly. Avi, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much for being a guest on the show. This was a great episode. Looking, looking forward to this landing on Spotify, et cetera, as part of our Tech Leaders Hub podcast too, because that is something that happens later on after the show. Meanwhile, Avi, do you have any shout outs or any calls to action as we marketers call it? Do you want people to follow you, do something else, sign up for some newsletter, anything that you want to leave with our audience here? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I think I, uh, mentioned everything that was, uh, important in my mind, you know, about the trends, uh, my insights and some other suggestions. So thanks, thanks for, uh, letting me do that and uh, nothing else on my side. No problem. Okay. So watchers and listeners definitely follow Avi Chesla, uh, wherever you can find him. Uh, we found our, each other through LinkedIn, so that might be a good place to start there. If you want to talk about cybersecurity a little bit more, then that is definitely a good place to start. Meanwhile, some people watching Tech Leaders Hub, you might be watching Tech Leaders Hub for the first time. Maybe you're meeting SDX Next for the first time, which is the company that is bringing you Tech Leaders Hub. Two words about that. So. STX Next is a company that, well, basically we do software development. If you're building a digital product and you want to build it faster and better, and your tech stack is based on Python, JavaScript, or .NET, and you want it done end-to-end -end with uh, design, development, deployment, adding on QA, DevOps, machine learning, data engineering as needed, we do all of that and more. Go to stxnext.com to find out about it. We can put a team together for you faster than you think. For more Tech Leaders Hub, go to techleadershub.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there and you will get notified about all upcoming sessions. You will also get recordings from previous sessions uh, so you can get more Tech Leaders Hub goodness in your inbox. And by the way, a great way to follow Tech Leaders Hub is also to follow STX Next on LinkedIn. This is where we post the most. We have clips from previous sessions in a nice nutshell format. You might enjoy that as well. 
Finally, if you're watching this and you're a CTO, then you might be interested in another initi initiative we're running called the Global CTO Survey. We're running the third edition of the Global CTO Survey this year. Last time we had over 500 responses from CTOs around the world. So it would be great if you could go to thectosurvey.com. It's with the the in front, thectosurvey.com. Go fill out the survey. You'll also get some freebies and goodies from our partners. So it'll be worth your while and you will be helping tech leaders everywhere and CTOs everywhere be more informed. So thectosurvey.com. Thank you ever so much. Anthony is coming in with <laughs> one last comment here saying, good points. Great to hear about a new innovation and the big data issue caused by SIEMs, XDRs is a real problem. Definitely, Anthony, I think this was a, a session worth having here today on Tech Leaders Hub. Definitely tune in next week. Actually, same time on Tuesday, we're doing another Tech Leaders Hub session and we're doing another one next Thursday that's going to have a special twist to it. So definitely Tuesday and Thursday, you should log into Tech Leaders Hub again. Meanwhile, thank you all so much for watching and listening, dear watchers and listeners. Thank you once again, Avi, for being our guest here on the show. Any final words or are we just going to end broadcast here? No, no it's my, <laughs> okay. my pleasure. Thank you. Rick. My pleasure as well. All right, everyone, have a nice day or morning or evening or night or whichever. We will see you next time in a week. See you then. Bye-bye.